Thanks for joining us once again for this second part of the interview that I did with Dr. Joe Martin. If you didn't get the opportunity to hear the first part of it, I want to ask you just to stop listening to this right now, go back and listen to the first part of his testimony, because we're going to continue where we left off and continue on into the ministry that he shares about. So without further ado, after the break, we're just going to continue that interview. Dr. Joe Martin. Welcome to Minister's Toolbox, providing leaders with the tools they need to succeed in ministry. Now, here's your host, Casey Sabella. You know, I was doing making more money part-time than people were making full-time. Yeah. And so I had made it, but that was the richest part. Then we get to the ruined part. How did and, you, before you get there, how did your sister respond and react to all of that? Oh, by the way, Casey, that's, that's what I mean. I should acknowledge God a little bit more. My sister became the first doctor in our family. Okay. She's a doctor. She's Dr. Uh, Martin. <laughs> but she's uh, what my son and my daughter call a real doctor. I'm just a, <laughs> I'm an education, but she's a real doctor. Okay. And so, but she said that how she got, she said, I inspired her. Mm -hmm. And, and I, let me use her words exactly. If my dumb brother can become a professor, I can, I can become a doctor. I can do whatever I want. <laughs> so she, I tell you, we didn't, we used to clash a lot. <laughs> so, so it inspired, she's thinking, wow. And she thought to the moon and back, she wants to find a cure for AIDS. That was her motivation because that's, that's nothing that rocked our city. When I was growing up, AIDS had hit. Remember the AIDS epidemic oh, yeah. that hit and when everybody was just dying left and right, my sister, that just tore her up. And when she was a kid, she said, I want to find a cure for AIDS. And we're thinking, Girl, you don't even like math or science. How are you going to become a doctor? Yeah. But when she saw me become a professor, she's thinking anything's possible. Same <laughs> right. So, yeah, so she she did well as well, which is I told my mom, I said, when she, my mom was living, I said, Mama, I don't know what you did, but God had a lot of grace on you because in spite of you, he covered us and protected us. Because how do you explain a high school dropout producing the youngest professor in the state of Florida and a doctor trying to find a cure for AIDS? Wow. <laughs> Unbelievable. Mm. And so... But the ruined part is I outran my past, but I didn't deal with my past. Mm. Okay, see, I didn't get healing from that. I didn't tell anybody about the um, uh, the sexual abuse, about my mom's alcoholism, about my low self-esteem being bullied in school, about watching my friends die, about all this negativity, about me starving and wanting to kill myself. I didn't tell anybody. So what I did is I so no, suppressed let me get this all straight. You went around to... Because you said you went around to various schools and various places telling your story, but it was mostly an education story. You never. No, it, yeah, it was more so of how I worked hard to achieve the degrees and gotcha. all of them, in spite of where I came. So I only told the parts of the stories that I thought I wasn't embarrassed about. Uh -huh. I wasn't ashamed of. So I didn't give them the real story. Right. I guess, oh, we grew up poor. And my mom and my mom was a teenage mother. And then I went, I, I got turned down by 30 colleges. And right. then I got a 4.0. You see what I'm leaving out? Yes. I'm leaving out a lot of other stuff in the story. I'm not mentioning about trying to kill myself. I ain't mentioning about being raped. Right. You know, I'm not saying any of this stuff. So as I'm living this life and I'm growing, I didn't even tell my wife when I got married wow. about this stuff. And so what that ended up happening that I wasn't, I wasn't, I was a successful male, but I wasn't a successful man. And my wife needed a man. She didn't need a male who had all these achievements and accomplishments. She needed somebody who can emotionally connect with her, somebody who could listen, somebody who could spiritually lead her. I didn't know how to spiritually lead a family. I wasn't taught how to do it. So I'm thinking all I got to do is be what, be the opposite of what I saw growing up. And the, the, that's the wrong way to try to learn by trying to do the opposite of what most people do. Try not what you don't want to be because you're focusing on what you don't want as opposed to focusing on what you do want. Sure. That's the equivalent of you driving down the road and only looking at the guardrails. Mm -hmm. Eventually your car is going to go and sway towards where you're focused on. Right. And so when my wife and I started getting into conflict, I wasn't equipped and ready to deal with it. So what did I do in all these, now the shame, cause she's triggering stuff in me that I hadn't dealt with. Shame, guilt, not being good enough. It's your fault. And so what I did, what most people do, they choose a medication. It right. could be alcohol. It could be drugs. It could be women. It could be whatever. Now, obviously, if you look at me, you can see me on this video. It ain't food. It wasn't <laughs> food. It was it was women, Casey. It was women. It started with pornography. 
And then it went to strip clubs. Then it went to escorts. Then it went to any woman I can get because if I had enough money, it, it just escalated and got out of control. And the worst thing you can do for a person who's wounded is give them money mm. because they're going to, they, they can afford the medication. And so I started cheating on my wife. I became a serial adulterer. And now you have to understand we met when we were teenagers and she was a virgin when I met her. So imagine oh, now children involved at this stage in the, in yeah, the I had a son at this time. I had a son. And so imagine what I did to her heart shattered in a million pieces. Yeah. And then that secret came out in the public. So went from rags to riches to now ruined. Again, thinking about suicide, thinking, God, you can't love me now. Because I've met you, you show me so much grace and mercy, pulling me out of that situation, bless me with all of this. And this is how I repay you mm. by not pursuing you, but pursuing my own pleasures, my own desires, breaking my covenant more than at least a thousand times. And this is how I repay you, God. You can't, you can't, not only can you not be pleased with me, you can't forgive me for this. Mm. You, I can't get past this. And it took me reaching my rock bottom to realize that God was that rock at that bottom and God surrounded me with some great friends, some great men who came into my life to kind of lift me up. How did you know that me. you were at rock bottom? I know people talk about rock bottom sometimes, but then there's another rock under the bottom. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's sometimes they got a basement below the, the, the last floor. No, I knew it was the end when I came to the end of myself and say, okay, God, I don't care what happens to me now. I'm going to serve you for the rest of my life. I don't care if I never get married again. I don't care if I never make another dime. I don't care if I have to live on the street. It's when I don't want anything else now but you. Because I always wanted God but something else. And, okay, God, you and this. God, you and that. It got to the point. I didn't care. God, I said, God, take my kid. I had one son. Take him. Because that's all I seen I had left was my son. If you got to take him, take my health, take whatever, God, I'm done. I whatever you want me to do, but God, I need help. I can't, I can't do this by myself. Please help me, mm -hmm. help me. And he, he gave me some friends who came to me and supported me, which is going into the transition of the redemption part. Where did those friends appear? How did they appear in your life? They were now imagine Casey, when you've had that much success, you meet a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And so, and all those people I met, guess what? Some of them were Christians. And some of them, they weren't, they weren't um, turned off by the fact that I was this disgusting, filthy adulterer who was living a double life and sleep with all these women. Oh, a lot of people turned their backs, but not your real friends. Mm -hmm. Not the ones who find you in the gutter who they know that they once were in the gutter too. Yeah. And that there was a savior. There was a savior that pulled them out of the gutter and didn't desert them. So they showed me the love of Christ. And when I saw that love of Christ, Casey, guess what? I wanted that. Mm. How can you love me, Casey, like this? Don't you see how filthy I am? And not only did they love me, they said, Joe, if we can love you like this, how much more does the father love you? And so one of my best friends, he reintroduced me, reintroduced me to Christ. Mm. And that's when I developed a real relationship with the Lord. And I didn't care if I had got anything back in return. I just wanted to be in his presence and love him. But you know what happens. He says, seek ye first his kingdom and his righteousness and all things will be added unto you. And guess what happened as I only sought him? He brought back my family. Wow. He brought back my career. He gave me a mission. He brought back friends and he gave me a peace that allowed me to share my story without shame. In case I have no no qual I don't care if anybody judges me. You're just a judge, but you're not the judge. That's it. And when you know you reach rock bottom because when people judge you and you don't care anymore, that's when you know you really have a real relationship. I'm not here to impress or to please man. I'm here to do the will of the Father at whatever cost to myself. I don't care what it costs me. God gave me another wife. He gave me custody of my son. This Can you believe that? I got custody of my son. <laughs> And he blessed me enough with a woman who was a single mom who had a daughter who dad left. Mm. And then he said, I trust you enough in spite of what you've done to raise this daughter.
And it still humbles me even to this day that God would trust me enough with somebody else's daughter. And so he restored me and redeemed me. But in that redemption part, I met a man who spiritually fathered me because I still need to know how to be a husband. I still need to know how to be a father. He spiritually discipled me and man changed my life. And I remember asking him, he's now been my spiritual father for the last 16 years. And he's helped me reconcile with my dad. So I've been reconciled with my, my biological father. He helped me to learn to forgive my mother. And so I was at peace even when my mom passed. I'm, I'm, I'm good friends with my dad even today. He's still alive. And I talked to him probably every other week. And I talked to him. And so, but Howard, my spiritual father, helped me mend those relationships. And he discipled me. In case I asked him, I said, Howard, I, can't, I don't know. He has eight kids of his own. <laughs> All right. But yet he discipled me. And I said, Howard, I don't know how um, I can repay you. What could I possibly do? He says, Joe, you don't owe me anything. He said, but I will ask you to do one thing for me. I said, what's that? I said, you name it. I'll do anything. He says, go make disciples. Mm. Go make it. What I've given to you, please go do it for others. That's when I launched Real Men Connect, our ministry, our organization. And he commissioned me to go make disciples. So our ministry, guess what our ministry is about, Casey? Helping men who had the same path that I was on, who need to write comeback stories, yeah. who think they're so far from God, there's no way God can reach them, that they've done just too much. So I can't even tell you what I've done because I'm too ashamed to admit it. You might look at me funny. They, they now have a safe place mm -hmm. to, to be redeemed, to be restored, but more importantly, to be discipled. One of and the we get them in community with other men to do that. One of the things in, in my own personal testimony, in my walk with Christ, and I ended up writing my first book about it, but I, I've been through a spiritual abuse situation, really mm -hmm. not in any way, uh, well, in some ways like what you've been through, but not the same dynamics. But yeah, we deal with a lot of men with that too. Yeah, I was in a church that started really well and ended really bad, and I, mm -hmm. and I wrote about it in my first book. But one of the, the reason I'm bringing this up is, apart from a, a shameless plug, is... Um, the, the dynamic of really leaving a spiritual abuse situation, so many people leave those situations but never deal with what got them involved in the first place. And there's a lot of people who've been through environments like yourself. Well, there's people who've been through those environments, and it never has a redemptive purpose because they don't, to your point, they don't really deal with it. They don't c come to a place where it doesn't matter what people think of them. They deal with the shame. So many people that have been through spiritual abuse situations wind up doing the very same thing again. It just becomes cyclical because mm -hmm. they never face what got them there in the first place. And in my particular testimony, I needed to go through some processes with my earthly father and others that I had to forgive, just to your same point. Had to forgive and release people that I was holding, holding perhaps even legitimate uh, things against. But it wasn't, you know, God expected from me to have to release them in order for him to really bring healing into my life. And it, it, in some ways, again, we don't have the same story by any means, but that right. same dynamic of using that story becomes redemptive because I can listen to a Jehovah's Witness. I've never been one. I've listened to Jehovah's Witness. I know exactly where they're at. I know exactly how they feel. I know I can smell it. Mm -hmm. Anything, anybody who's been in an abuse situation, I oftentimes they say, well, you've been through the same situation. And I say, well, no, I haven't. But there's a dynamic there of shame. There's a dynamic there of trying to hide uh, what was done wrong. And when you really face it and let the Lord cleanse you, you end up being a source of really ministering to other people. Right. And and that's how God has used my life. I, I never thought that I would be getting on stages because I travel across the country speaking to a lot of men's conferences. Um, just got back from Indiana um, a couple of weeks ago. And I get on the stage and I'm opening up my heart, telling men this exactly what I'm telling you on the show. And it's amazing how they come and they flood to you because they're thinking, wow, if he can do that, man, if they don't know Jesus, they want to know the Jesus I know. Mm -hmm. Cause man, if he can do that for him, maybe he can do it for me too. And, but it also gives them permission um, to be able to share their story. And you, you said, yeah, the situations are different. Our situations are different, but guess what? The suffering is the same. Mm. It's the same because I don't look at the specific situation, Casey, what people are going through. And I guess that's why we've been able to relate so well to all these men. We have men from, um, what, five different countries in our ministry and from all over the world. I say our ministry looks actually like heaven, not church. Your listeners will get that later on. But um, it actually looks like heaven. Hopefully. <laughs> yeah. But uh, but what I because they'll say, wow, you know, man, Joe, I, and I need people who've been through the same situation. I said, no, you don't. 
what you need to be around is a group of men who've been through the same struggle. They said, what do you mean? Isn't that the same? I said, no. I said, let me, I said, I don't know. Don't even tell me your situation, but ask me, can you relate this? Have you ever felt alone? Have you ever felt abused, taken advantage of, been afraid, been betrayed, been isolated, been misunderstood, been confused, been desperate, been depressed? They say, yeah. I said, guess what? Me too. Mm. I didn't even tell you what my situation was, but you and I just connected based on that. We focus so much sometimes on the specific situation that we miss the person and their suffering. And so I don't care if they're old, young, black, white. I connect to their suffering, not their situation. Mm -hmm. And that's how we attract men to our ministry. What are some of the resources? Obviously, a lot of the folks that are listening to us are from a pastoral standpoint, and many of them are trying to get more men involved in their church in meaningful ways. And uh, it's not just a matter of having a lot of bacon on Saturday morning. It, there's got to mm -hmm. be, you know, something goes a little deeper than that. And uh, how do you, how does a pastor, for example, listening to this, you know, develop a meaningful men's ministry? Obviously the dynamic of being authentic really plays very central to this, mm -hmm. but genuinely reaching out to the men in their community. Um, what are some of the resources that you offer and maybe some of the suggestions you might have? Well, we know we work with churches. I, I, a lot of times when I'm asked to speak at men's conferences or speak at churches, it's because they want to engage their men. Um, the, when I was uh, the leader of my men's ministry before I started my organization, it was the largest ministry in the church, which is rare in a church to see the men's ministry bigger than the women's ministry or the marriage ministry. But we were able to bring them in and, and attract them. And here's how, and I'll give the, the quickest way I can tell you, and this is for any pastor out there listening, because he has to do it. You have to have what I call multiple entries, um, 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 entrance points for your men. You, sure. men. you can't do men's ministry across the board the same way. Yes, it's going to be under the same church, but you got to have a different way of attracting the men. And there's levels to it. One is um, fellowship. You got to have a fellowship level, which most churches are familiar with when it comes to the fellowship level. That's the, the pancake breakfast, <laughs> you know, when they come there on the Saturday once a month. But that's not enough if you really want to see your men's ministry grow. But that's the way you get them there is through that. But you have to have a next step and you can't stop at fellowship. It's OK, we'll come back here next Saturday and we'll right. do it again. No, you got to have a deeper level that they can get to for the men who are ready to go to the next level, which is brotherhood. You got fellowship. Hey, how you doing, man? It's nice to see you. Okay, I'll see you in another month. But then you got to have brotherhood. That means you got to be smaller groups where men can be more transparent and vulnerable. They're not going to do that in fellowship. I'm not going to tell you I was abused eating pancakes and, and bacon with you. All right. But you got to give me an opportunity well, someplace you know, to, I can go. You know, just, to, just to contradict that a little bit, sometimes, I mean, enough bacon and you might just. <laughs> you might. <laughs> that's right. You might say anything. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> But you got to have that next level, Casey, that they can go from fellowship to brotherhood. You got to give them an opportunity. These are entry level points. Not every guy is ready to go from fellowship to brotherhood, but you got to at least get that red, that guy to the brotherhood. And I'm going to tell you why you're going to be losing them as you go, but you're going to watch the ministry grow because you get to brotherhood where they're now safe that we can share this kind of stuff. We're talking and we're connected. Wow. But you got to have a next level for that guy. And but that's how gonna would be you just to, you know, to be real specific, how would you mm -hmm. let's just say you have your pancake breakfast in our case. Right. We just basically give them a pound of bacon. But um, how do you bring them or bring men, and this is for other pastors, how do you bring them to a place where they want to be in a, in a small group or something like that? Because typically it's not like men saying, wow, where can I find a place that I can, you know, share? Open uh, up and share. Right. So That's what is, I mean, I mean there are dynamics that are certainly organic. I mean, you know, just doing stuff together, going places together, that kind of thing. But I, I know I'm being a little bit... Um, anal about this, but helping, helping pastors, you know, going through those steps, guys aren't going to go necessarily from pancake breakfast to whatever, unless there's sort of a bridge, I guess I'm trying to get right. And, and I'm glad you brought it up because you're right. Cause I'm giving you the quickest version, but sure, there's, la there's layers to this. We, we, we train churches on how to do this stuff, but it's called invite. It's the type of invite you do. So you, in, you know, Hey, we having some free breakfast and we got, um, Casey's coming out here to speak to us. They come out and get some food. That's the invite. But you got to invite them to the next level. How do you do that? Very easy. You got to go to what we were talking about before. You got to speak to their suffering. Mm. So, hey, at the Miz, at that breakfast, hey, I know all of you may not be interested in this, but we have a great workshop on how to save a dying marriage. Mm -hmm. 
I know all you got awesome marriages and if you could do it all over your marriage, but for some of you who may think about, you know, thought about, wow, if I could do this all over, if I had a do over, I would, you might want to come to this or now I'm just picking marriage, but I can go in any area. If you've been struggling with, um, walking in sexual purity or di- having lustful thoughts and you want to get better control. Now, notice I'm not saying porn because that's shameful. Right. Battling with lust in your thought life and walking in sexual purity. Now, I know a lot of you have already mastered this, but right. if you're really, you see what you we're doing? You tell them that they already did it because the ego's involved. Right. <laughs> but So maybe you guys can help us out by training us who are struggling in this area. You see what I'm, I'm inviting yeah. them to the next, to a struggle meeting. Where you're going to get around, because once you get the, in that group, first of all, it's not going to be a lot of people, <laughs> all right? <laughs> but when you get them in there, you now you get them in the smaller groups where they can open up and share. So it's really based on the kind of level of invite. Mm-hmm. Here's what we do at churches. Breakfast meeting. Now, tell me if this works. Breakfast meeting. How, okay, you guys have a great breakfast. Hey, who wants to go on a mission trip to Haiti? <laughs> Come on now. That, hey, can we kind of get married? Can we date a little bit first? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> So we we want we hit them too if hard. If you're a real Christian, you'd want to go to Haiti. I'm yeah, if you're a real Christian, you're real <laughs> spiritual. You want to do this. You know the Lord is telling you, come on, man. Let <laughs> let's let's take some baby steps first. Yeah, bring them in to eat. Invite them to discuss something that's important to them. Yep, to them. You know where they're hurting. Work life balance. That's a great one to get them. If you are stressed out and you just feel like you got too much on your plate, we're going to have a great session with Casey. He's going to talk to us about work-life balance. Like Today, I had a group today, this morning before I got on the call with you. Guess what our topic was? The seven stages of change and why you're stuck and how to get unstuck. Mm-hmm. We had a great turnout for that. And so you got you to invite them to the next place where they can share that they'll get around other people with similar problems and similar struggles. Good. But now you go from now from fellowship to brotherhood because they're sharing a little bit. Now you invite them to discipleship. The invitation. How do you invite somebody to go from that to discipleship? Wow. You know, hey, I don't know if any of you guys would be interested in this, but if some of you are feeling kind of like just kind of stuck in your faith that you want to go to a deeper level that you just want to, you just ain't getting there and you want to go even deeper because you're just now you're getting into your quiet time and you learn stuff, but you want to go around deeper. We're getting a small group of brothers together and we're going to go through a curriculum of discipleship. Now you may only get five or six guys from that, but watch what happens. We're having, we got, Hey, we got a sign up sheet over there. This is at that, the struggle thing or at the breakfast you're invited. If anyone goes deeper, we got a great group. Case and I are getting some guys together. We're going to do that, and they show up for that. And now, when they go, go through, and we're going to go shooting afterwards or something. Yeah, <laughs> but now, but here's the thing: you don't even have to promise them that after, because guess what? They can get that from the fellowship. Yeah. Guess what? They got a shooting thing next Saturday. Go to that. I'm not bringing. I'm not going to mention that in the discipleship group. We're here for the people who are serious about this. Yep. We got a lot of fellowship stuff you can go to. If you guys want to talk about your issues and your problems, we still got some struggle stuff you can talk to in that group. This is for the people who want to be discipled because where do we try to lead them to? To disciple making. Excellent. Because the discipleship thing is not a hit or miss. It's not a one-time thing to hear Casey speak. This is over maybe six months, a year, two years. Right now, I'm in my sixth discipleship group that goes about a year to year and a half. Guess what? I got guys asking me, can they be in it? I'm not even asking anymore. They said, Joe, when are you going to start your next discipleship group? All right, okay, we got to finish this one first. We got about another eight months, but I'll put you on my list. Isn't that what churches really want? For guys to start coming to them saying, hey, can I be in your next discipleship group? Big time. Because they're thinking, I want to grow in Christ. But guess what I had to start with? Fellowship, brotherhood, discipleship. Now, here's what we do now that we got them in the discipleship group. From day one, as soon as they come in, okay, we're going to be here for a year, year and a half, Casey. But now understand, yes, you're going to be a better husband. Yes, you're going to be a better father. Yes, you're going to be a better spiritually. It's almost guaranteed because we're going to do life together. But listen, this is all, you're wasting your time. And this is all for nothing if you don't go out and multiply after you finish this. So what am I challenging you to do? Don't start this, Casey, in this, this disciple-making program if you're not going to go make disciples at the end of it. So you have the chance to quit today or you're going to sign up for this, that you're going to be, you're going to be equipped to make disciples later. And every guy that right now, I started a group here in Chattanooga about six years ago. It is now multiplied into like 20 something groups that they don't even know me. They're smaller groups 
that are started in the city. That's disciple making. And so the answer to your question, the original question, how do we get men more and get, you got to bring them and take them through elevations because the people who are going to grow your ministry is not going to be the fellowship brothers. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be the brotherhood brothers because they're too ashamed to tell anybody else they're going to this small group. It's going to be the disciple making brothers who they're going back and guess what they're doing? They're setting up fellowship. They're setting up the small groups. They're setting up disciple making. That's how we've been able to expand. And that's what I train churches on how to do with their men. Excellent. I really just so much appreciate uh, your ministry. And uh, obviously just in a few moments, it's going to share how they can contact you. But I really do want to thank you for uh, being part of these these podcasts with us. It's just been really helpful. And uh, yeah, just God bless you and what you're doing. Oh, my pleasure, Casey. Thank you so much for having me on the show. And I'm encouraging the guys, don't give up on your men in your church. They, I, I call it, we, we suffer from a learning disability that was undiagnosed as a child. It's called ABT, ain't been taught. We just haven't been taught yet. So have patience with us. They just need to be taught. And, um, and so continue to be encouraged in leading them, especially the men at your church. I know everybody at your church is important, but especially the men, because as goes the head, so goes the body. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thanks once again for joining us for this interview. I know that you have gotten as much out of it as I have. Just a tremendous testimony and an incredible ministry. This is a badly needed ministry in the body of Christ. And if you are a pastor or a leader who really would like more resources or wants to connect a little bit more with Dr. Martin, I'll have all of that information for you at our website at ministerstoolbox.com. If you've been watching this podcast via YouTube, would you do me a favor and go ahead and subscribe? And then share it with somebody else. Take and use the share button. Send it to somebody else in email or however you'd like to do on social media. Put it on Facebook, however you'd like to share it. Let's get the word out about this incredible ministry. Thanks once again. As you know, I end each podcast with a quote especially for you. This one is from Harry Ward Beecher, who said, The real man is one who always finds excuses for others but never excuses himself. Wise words. Until next time. For more resources, go to ministerstoolbox.com. Thanks for listening.